The Golem is an incredibly widely beloved and very ancient product of Jewish folk stories. Its origins can be found as far back as the 6th century. And in fact, a lot of the themes that are a part of the Golem come out of Genesis itself. To sum it up, a Golem is a creature made of mud or clay that a rabbi has quite literally infused with life. He is a warrior and kind of like a gentle giant. And he's incredibly popular right now. You can find him in tons of popular media and he's really been claimed by a lot of contemporary Jewish artists as a lot of us kind of get back in touch with our folk traditions. But there's a darker side of the story of the golem that is really often overlooked. It might surprise you to know that the story that we usually associate with the golem really only came together in the late 19th, early 20th century. He's born out of a very, very deep and ancient pain. And that trauma is what we're going to be talking about today. As I record this video right now, we are 22 days into the quote unquote war between Hamas and Israel, which of course is much more of a genocide than anything. At the time of this recording, it's been 22 days since Hamas launched an attack on people in Israel. The events of that day led to the loss of 1,400 lives, and in the weeks since, the death toll in Gaza has now topped 8,000, as Israel rains down bomb after bomb after bomb, ending the lives of so, so many innocent civilians almost half of them children. Over the last couple days, the internet was turned off in Gaza, the communications tower was bombed, and there was a complete blackout as Israel continued its raids on Palestinians. We can't even think about covering all of the events that have happened and that continue to happen, but what we do know is that this is an attempt at genocide. It is very obvious to anyone that has all of these facts in their hands that this is exactly what Netanyahu and his party have been waiting for for a long time. They want to wipe out Palestinians themselves. There are a lot of reasons why these events can be really difficult to comprehend. I understand why a lot of people say, hey, this is not complex. It's Israel oppressing Palestine. And it's true. That part of the history, when you look at it all laid out, is not complex. What kind of a war is it when one side can determine how much electricity and fuel and internet and food and water and medical aid that the other side can get? It makes no sense. So in this way, the story is very simple. But today I wanna to talk about parts that we usually avoid things that make this particular clash a little bit unique. And specifically, what I'm talking about here is trauma. I don't think we can fully understand the violence that is being enacted right now without understanding the deep-seated trauma that is so much a part of how we got here. This is the first YouTube video that I've made, so this is going to be messy for a number of reasons because it's the first video, because this topic is inherently messy, because we're in a time where information is rapidly changing. I'm not going to say nearly everything I want to say or that should be said, but hopefully it's a start. And hopefully we can think through some of these things together. So back to the golem, because we all love the golem, right? I really do. I want to preface this by saying I really do love the Golem. I think most iterations of him are wonderful, sometimes adorable, and often just really, really badass. I should say that again. It is really, really badass. In any case. Hello, this is Issa from about a week later after doing more reading and after editing the first round of this video. It can be argued that the origins of the golem can be found in Genesis, when God shapes Adam out of clay. It is in the Talmud, though, that in the hours before Adam is fully human, Adam is called a golem, which translates to 
unformed, imperfect, body without a soul, or dust that is kneaded into a shapeless husk. However, it is said that the first practical instructions on how a human being could create a golem were written down in the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Creation, an early text of Jewish mysticism. It's estimated that this book was written around the 6th century. Now, if you find yourself opening the Sefer Yetzirah, uh, be prepared to find that the term practical instructions on how to create a golem is a little bit of a stretch. It is an incredibly complicated and archaic system of formulas from the era of proto-Kabbalah. If one fully understood it, could you create life out of dust? I don't know. Well, who am I to say? Don't get me wrong, it's extremely cool, but you're probably not gonna get it right away. I know, I don't get it at all. I'm very sorry if you're disappointed, but in any case, all you have to know right now is that in Jewish religion, culture, and mysticism, numbers and Hebrew letters are believed to be endowed with great power. They're incredibly important. This is why we have long had protective amulets covered with writing, tiny scrolls with written prayers tucked inside, boxes that hang on our doorways, and the very acts of reading and writing Torah are also incredibly holy. And the Torah itself is central to everything. But back to the golem. Rabbi J. Michelson writes that the Talmud relates a tale of rabbis who grew hungry while on a journey, so they created a calf out of earth and ate it for dinner. The Kabbalists, or Jewish mystics, determined that the rabbis did this magical act by permuting language, primarily utilizing the formula set forth in the Sefer Yetzirah, or Book of Creation. Just as God speaks and creates in the Genesis story, so too can the mystic. Indeed, the word abracadabra initially arrives from avra kadavara, Aramaic for I create as I speak. Thus, under the rarest circumstances, a human may imbue lifeless matter with that intangible but essential spark of life, the soul. That permutation of language, that is key. What that means is that the rabbi tries out different combinations of letters until, as some stories put it, he comes across the secret name of God, which is meant to be essentially unknowable by humans and itself endowed with great powers, such as the power to give life. Medieval Kabbalists saw the creation of the golem as a kind of alchemical task, the accomplishment of which proved the adept's skill and knowledge of the Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism. They also saw it as a way... <laughs> They also saw it as a way to come closer to God. In other versions of the story, words hold power in a slightly different way. The Hebrew word emet is etched onto the forehead of the golem, which brings it to life. To kill it, all you need to do is erase the first part of the word, which changes emet to met, or death. Interestingly, in many or most golem tales, the golem itself cannot speak. He himself is not fully human, kind of because he cannot communicate. He cannot shape his mouth around that thing that we find most holy, letters and words. And in that way, he does not have a soul. Begging the question, is he really alive? Throughout the centuries, there are lots of folk stories of rabbis creating golems or glamim. The general thrust of many of these stories, and honestly, quite a few Hasidic and otherwise Ashkenazi folktales themselves, is there was once a rabbi who was so studious and so close to God, he did this magical and wonderful thing, essentially performing a miracle, slash being a superhero. But it actually wasn't until the 1800s when we saw the golem become a protector of Jews in the tale that he's most widely known for, Rabbi Lo and the Golem of Prague. Something that's foundational, of course, to understand about Jewish history in general, but also this entire video, everything we're about to be talking about, is that Jews have undergone periods of intense oppression and, and have faced, Jews have, us Jews, <laughs> Jews have undergone, Jews have undergone oppression periodically for centuries and centuries and centuries, ever since we came into being as a people. As we'll talk about later, there have been many periods of peace, but 
our history and the way we understand ourselves is as a people who have persisted despite so many threats to our very existence. Maybe I can do a little rolling list here of maybe just a couple of the pogroms and the attacks and the attempts at ethnic cleansing and the expulsions and the laws against, I don't know, us being able to move around and wear whatever we want and practice our religion and all of those things. So by the time the late 1800s rolls around, this has happened a lot. And this particular story is centered in the town of Prague. There's a rabbi who was a real person his name is Rabbi Lowe. He's one of those rabbis that kind of turn into superheroes. He can do magic, you know, he's really good at Kabbalah. He can actually make the magic happen. And he creates a golem as a way of protecting the Jewish people against Christians who are blaming Jews for or draining the blood of a Christian child for the purposes of, I guess, making matzah or Shabbos dinner or like all these incredibly silly things. It's called blood libel. Look it up. It's a whole thing. Long story short, the golem becomes really helpful in protecting the Jews from the Christians who are encroaching and trying to kill us. This is also around the time uh, where the notion of the Jewish strong man is growing. There have always been strong Jews, of course. Like any population of people, there's always been Jews that are incredibly physically strong. But this notion of kind of focusing on them really started to grow during this time. Ooh! A lot of the early mafia in the US was Jewish. And also there was a time when many pro wrestlers were Jewish. There was also a point when a ton of basketball players were Jewish. There he goes. Yeah. Oh no, where are you going? Hi. Yeah, he's just, yes, he joined us. Pikachu has joined the party. Let's see how long he stays, take bets. But I think the most exciting legacy to come out of all of this was probably Superman. Superman is seen by many as a kind of a golem himself, or a golem, sort of a golem himself. This incredibly strong alien protector of oppressed people. And he did fill that role for a long time, especially in the 1940s when he smashed the Klan in his very famous series, Superman and the Clan of the Fiery Cross. I highly recommend that you listen to the whole thing and also read Superman Smashes the Clan, a contemporary graphic novel that illustrates the story that was told there. In real life, there were sort of real life supermen that came out of the mafia that also beat up Nazis. So this was also kind of based on real life as well. During this time, there was a lot of popularity again around these really strong manly Jews. One of the most famous was named Zaisha Breitbart. He was a wrestler. He also could like bend iron. And I believe he was originally an iron worker as well. He was also a Zionist, a very, very, very intense Zionist and became kind of a mythical Zionist hero. This is where I think we start to get to the darker part of the Gollum story. As the story of the golem evolves over time, there become tellings of it that are less of a hero story and more of a warning. The golem changes from being sort of an amoral or benevolent giant to sort of encapsulating and feeding on evil itself. Eventually, it becomes dangerous for the Jewish people and a threat to our very existence. The golem in that way becomes a sort of myth about hubris and a myth about what is it like when we use physical force to defend ourselves to the point when not only are more people than deserve it get into danger, but that we also come into danger ourselves. And in real life now, I think that happens when we lose 
our sense of who we are. So back to this notion of the Jewish strong man. I recently went to Yivo's exhibition called Palestinian Yiddish, which talks about how Yiddish and Ashkenazi culture were very, very oppressed and frowned upon in the early years of Zionism until eventually Yiddish speaking was wiped out around Israel. So what they say is that one of the cultures Zionism aimed to replace was Yiddish culture. Zionism hoped to build a new type of Jew, one that was both highly cultured, attached to the land, and physically strong. The ideology of this new Hebrew-speaking Jew was created in contrast to the allegedly weak and pathetic diaspora Jews whose language was Yiddish. This ideology held that Jews could only be emancipated and independent in their own homeland and that they were rootless and weak outside of it. To many Zionists, Yiddish language and culture was symbolic of that weakness. A couple things to note about this. One is that this has long been a stereotype from outside of Judaism as a stereotype by our oppressors, especially that Jewish men are weak and effeminate. The other part of this is that Zionists wanted a complete end to the notion that Jews were victims. And they saw Jews that were victims as weak and not people that they should take care of, but people rather that should be kind of forgotten about because the Jews that would eventually redeem our name among the nations would be warriors and never victims. So this is, of course, internalized anti-Semitism. There was another reason that the erasure of Yiddish was so important to the founding of Israel. In fact, it's a central reason. It was to erase the history and culture of the Jews that had lived there for hundreds of years in peace next to their non-Jewish neighbors, speaking this Palestinian Yiddish dialect. Now, the way I organized this video, that whole discussion for some reason comes at a later part which makes it no less important. If you would like to skip ahead, choose your own adventure, you can feel free to go to this timestamp to learn a little bit about that and then come back here. Totally up to you. It should be noted that this idea of Zionism, of political Zionism, I should say, we should all return to the land of Israel and create our nation state there, began as a minority opinion and grew over time. Over the years, as Israel was growing as a nation, these anti-Yiddishists were themselves a minority that even recognized that they were zealots, they were extremists. And that was another notion that grew over time. This is something we see a lot through Israeli history, that these movements that start as small extremist movements that everybody thinks is crazy, eventually take over everything and determine the propaganda and the national myth-making and storytelling that define Israeli identity and the way that the larger world, well, you know, those that support Israel, look at Israel. I'm gonna pause for a second and, you know, because I imagine that some of people are asking, why are we talking about this? Why should we look into the minds of people that are, are enacting such horrible oppression and enacting currently genocide. It's because specifically I see this question come up a lot, which is how is it that the people that, how is it that the people that experience the Holocaust, how do I want, oh my God, how do I want to say this? Which is that, <laughs> how could people that have experienced the Holocaust enact a genocide themselves. And honestly, most of the time when this question is asked in my comment section, I get a little annoyed <laughs> because most people that ask this question, I'm sorry if this isn't you, if it doesn't apply, let it fly, are asking it in a rhetorical way. They're not actually interested in learning. But if this is something that you're wondering about, I invite you to actually learn about it because it can actually illustrate and maybe help you understand why what we're seeing today is as dark and as horrific as it is. 
Anyway. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking about this. And in order to illustrate this history, we're going to go to the era just after the Holocaust. This comes from an article that tells the story of a post-Holocaust group called the Nakam. It's by author Shane Burley. He's very smart. Highly recommend. This article is actually a review of a book called Nakam, The Holocaust Survivors Who Sought Full-Scale Revenge. This group, again, was called the Nakam, which is Hebrew for vengeance. And it was made up of the Nokmim, or the Avengers. But not like those Avengers. These Avengers. Who had aspirations to kill six million Germans. Revenge, of course, for these six million Jews lost during the Shoah. The book centers on Israeli poet Abba Kovner, a member of the socialist Zionist Hashemur Hatzer, and a partisan fighter who founded the Nakam. Many of the people in the Nakam had found their entire families massacred, their houses occupied by the same neighbors who had turned them in, and some even feared the pogroms would continue unabated. He recruited around 50 members. Goodbye, Kitty. Unfortunately, he's left me during the most difficult part. Kovner set off for the Yeshuv, which was the Jewish community in Palestine at the time, to acquire poison for two potential plots. Plan A was to poison the water supply of a major German city, hopefully reaching a death toll of 6 million, while Plan B was to kill only acutely guilty SS soldiers, which numbered in the thousands. Kovner met with Yeshuv leaders, and it was clear, well, there may have been sympathy with Plan A, only Plan B would receive the support of even the angriest of Palestine's Jewish community. Kovner was also a partisan hero. Partisans were the paramilitary groups that fought the Nazis. Now, the history of the partisans is deserving of its own video. <laughs> I'm just purring so loud. <laughs> New location, same animal. <laughs> we're even in a different, we're in a different building. You followed me here. Uh, call him. Call him. Many of the 20,000 Jewish partisans had escaped from ghettos and camps and hid out in Eastern European forests where, despite immense danger, they were quite successful at killing and otherwise sabotaging Nazi forces by, for example, destroying infrastructure like supply chains, power plants, and communication lines. They also freed prisoners, smuggled people to safety, and did a ton of other extremely heroic things. Unfortunately, as mentioned, many were intensely traumatized by what they had seen and experienced during the Holocaust. And after the war, some felt like they had nowhere to channel seemingly unbounded anger. Those few who wanted to seek revenge may have found themselves in groups like the Nakam. Plan A, the one to kill six million Germans, was seductive specifically because it was every bit as indiscriminate as the murder of Jews itself. It was the utter destruction of a nation, one whose guilt was seen as ubiquitous. The story was understood as the biblical Amalekites, enemies of Israel whose total eradication was required in order to restore the dignity of Jewish peoplehood. Dina Porat, who is the author of this book, portrays Kovner's bloodlust and Israeli acceptance of it as self-evident which it may have been for the Hebrew readership that grew up around these stories. During the formation of the State of Israel, the new Yeshuv was flooded by thousands of thoroughly traumatized people, fragments of families and lives arriving at what many hoped would finally be a safe haven for Jews. Their anger was palpable and visible, and it's part of the founding myths of Israel itself. This sense of necessary revenge has always played a role in Israel's national story. The kidnapping and execution of Adolf Eichmann, the retaliatory attacks during both the 1948 war of Israel's founding and subsequent conflicts with Arab neighbors, and the frequent bulldozing of homes of families it suspects of abetting terrorism. When Hamas fires rockets over the border into Israel proper, they pale in comparison to the IDF's shock and awe response, which presumes an overwhelmingly violent counterattack 
will make Israel safer. He also goes on to talk about the far-right Rabbi Mayor Kahane. Oh, that can't be right. Mayor Kahane? Mayor Kahan? I've heard Kahane, but that could be wrong. In his view, Jews take revenge against their oppressors, not only for their own redemption, but for God's. Yes, we are now in the territory of trauma-informed Jewish extremism. The growth of Kahanism and congruent far-right theologies in the settlements has created a culture of performative revenge through paycheck attacks against Arabs, which is supposed to raise the cost of living for Arabs in a land that Jewish militants believe was given to them by God. But wait, there's more. Yitzhak Shapira, a popular rabbi in the settlements, wrote a book called The King's Torah, suggesting that it is always just to kill a Gentile if a Jew's life could at some point be on the line. There is a reason to kill babies on the enemy side, he says, because of the future danger they may present since it is assumed that they will grow up to be evil like their parents. The Nokmim's rage, initially directed at the Germans, would eventually shift to Arabs. It functioned as a subtext in Israeli responses to Palestinian demands for autonomy, which was animated by the belief that Jewish victimhood resulted from Jewish inaction, which is what enabled others to enact cruelty upon them. As an aside here, it's me, I'm back with my words for the moment. So much of this history and so many of the problems that surround it come from the fact that we do not explore our own history of resistance. This is a problem in almost every Holocaust museum that I've been to and almost every retelling of the Holocaust that exists, which completely overlooks how many thousands of ways that Jews as well as communist Romani, so many people that were persecuted by the Nazis fought back till the end. So this idea that we were always passive victims is an idea that has been foisted onto us from the outside and has been really taken up by these militant assholes who seem to believe that the only way to reverse that is to enact violence upon other groups of oppressed people, not to resist the white supremacist anti-Semites, for example. <laughs> While the Nokmim lived a desperate life in those early post-war months, they eventually integrated into the mosaic of Israeli society. They carried those experiences into agencies like the Mossad, a number of whose early agents were Nakam members. Other Nokmim led Jewish forces against Palestinians in the Nakba, the disaster and expulsion of Arabs that adjoined Israel's foundation. Kovner became a propaganda officer, writing poems that chastised Jewish troops for the emotional strife that they felt when engaging in war crimes against Arabs and for retreating when victory became impossible. This story is emblematic of an enormous foundational part of the Israeli country, of the country of Israel, the myth-making around that. Kovner's poetry was actually in itself a weapon. One of the section titles in this article is that no one would look at Jews as victims again. One of the things that I'm learning now about Israeli society and culture is just how much victims are looked down upon or anybody that is seen as a victim. If you actually started looking into how Holocaust survivors are treated and exist within Israeli society, you'll quickly find out that they are not the ones that are making the decisions here. Most of them are on the fringes. They're ignored. They're looked down upon. Around a third of living Holocaust survivors today in Israel live in poverty. Horribly, that number is basically the same here in the US. There are still tens of thousands, possibly how many Holocaust survivors? Are there? there are still hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors out there. And instead of sitting with them, listening to them, nurturing them, caring for them, attending to their needs, both in the US and in Israel, they are ignored and they are 
deprived of the resources that they require. One survivor, Dora Roth, said that when she arrived in Israel after the Holocaust, Israelis treated them as if what happened to them was somehow their fault. I heard many times that we went like sheep to the slaughter, she said. Roth has also spoken out a lot about the fact that many, many, many Holocaust survivors in Israel have not gotten the reparations that they are due. Specifically, the billions of dollars that Germany gave the Israeli government in order to disperse to them so that they could live and be healthy and happy, as happy as possible. A lot of that money has been squandered. Most Holocaust survivors have seen very, very, very little of what is owed to them. Higher issue of all of the money that is owed to Holocaust survivors, both Jewish and non-Jewish, is an entire topic, one of many that we're touching on that deserves its own couple of hours of discussion, particularly because there are billionaires, lots of billionaires that live in Germany off of the blood money that was attained through the Holocaust, off of their deaths and their families' deaths, um, and anyway, the billionaires still have that, and the survivors don't, and that is pretty silly to me. In any case, there's this notion in Israel that having violence enacted on you is equal to being a weak Jew, and because of that, you are not as valuable to Israeli society, a culture of warriors. The suppression of Yiddish culture and Ashkenazi culture, of course, is wrapped up in all of this. And it's also a part of the fabrication of this Israeli identity, which is similar, sort of, to the fabrication of a white identity. I'm going to say sort of because a lot of Israelis, a lot of Israelis, perhaps most Israelis, do not see themselves as white. Most Israelis are not Ashkenazi. Most Israelis come from the Swana region originally, or that's where their families come from. They are Sephardic Jews, and some of them are Mizrahi Jews, a term which only stretches back to the founding of Israel itself. For much of the beginning of Israeli history, these were dominated by the Ashkenazim, the wider European and Eastern European Jews. So here's where things get, you know, a little complicated, right? The Misrahim, a general term for Jews from countries from the Middle East and North Africa, is also a political sociological term that was coined with the creation of Israel. Between 1948 and the early 1980s, more than 850,000 Jews left or were expelled from countries in the region. As of 2005, 61% of Israeli Jews were of full or partial Misrahi ancestry. Mizrahi Jews are still, to this day, in many senses looked down upon and have fewer opportunities than their Ashkenazi counterparts in Israel. And there is a lot 
a lot of resentment there. It is not Ashkenazi Jews, but as I understand it, Mizrahi Jews that make up a large portion of the people that lend the strongest support to Netanyahu and the Likud party, which is the party to the right. This may be a little confusing if there's new information to you. I know it was for me. You might think to yourself, why isn't it that they are fighting against this far right party or this move to the right when it's so racist, you know, within itself. Well, one thing is that a lot of it has to do with class. A lot of these folks on the far right or right wing in Israel have less money historically than people on the left. In fact, you can find similarities or parallels in how this whole paradigm works in the US. It's a similar question of why are these people voting against their interests? Part of the explanation for it is that similar to white folks in Appalachia, for example, the left kind of treats them as uncultured and uncivilized and stupid. You know, I just don't understand why poor white people in rural areas keep voting for Republicans. It's like you're literally voting against your own best interest. Greetings, racist idiots. I've come to save you from yourselves. You are everything that's wrong with this country, and that's why I need you to vote for me. If you can figure out how to read the ballot. Do you have reading and writing here? There's an old saying in this part of the country, and it goes like this. I can't read. Some people describe the behavior of left-leaning Ashkenazi Israelis as sometimes arrogant. An arrogance that goes back to the first years of the state when they saw us as cultureless and did not understand that we have different priorities that are no less legitimate. Now, of course, before when I asked, Doi, why aren't Mizrahi Jews fighting against this racist system? Well, of course, many are. <laughs> and naturally, looking at their work is very helpful for untangling this. I highly recommend this article by Hadar Cohen, a Mizrahi Jewish artist who proudly calls herself an Arab Jew. Because that is what many Mizrahi Jews are. Jews whose families come from Arab nations, who for many centuries spoke dialects of Arabic. Cohen writes beautifully about how, to be a full member of Israeli society, she has to suppress and cover up that Arab part of her identity. My identity has been a great source of internal confusion that has taken me years to unpack and untangle. I identify as an Arab Jew. My family has lived in Jerusalem for over 10 generations, and my other ancestral cities include Aleppo in Syria, Baghdad in Iraq, and Shiraz in Iran, along with a small village in Kurdistan. I grew up with primarily Syrian-Palestinian traditions and cultures. My grandfather was a prayer leader and skilled at the art of makamat, a unique Arab melodic framework who recited prayers in the Syrian Jerusalemite tradition. My family prayed in Hebrew and Arabic, with a thick accent rolling off our tongues as we pronounced Jewish blessings. Until my parents' generation, Arabic was the predominant language in my family. In our traditional Jewish home, observing Syrian-Palestinian heritage and culture came with ease. Jewish and Arabness fit together cohesively. There was no contradiction. But outside of our home, my faith and culture clashed. The state of Israel conditioned me to see the intersection of Jewish and Arab as non-existent or impossible, even though Arab Jews have lived at this intersection for years. I learned that in order to belong to Israeli society and participate in the Zionist project, I had to reject all parts of myself, the Arab parts. Zionism teaches that Arabs are the enemies of the Jews, and in doing so, it completely fragmented my identity. On the one hand, I enjoy Jewish privileges from the state. On the other hand, I need to hate the Arab part of me to fully become part of Israeli society. There is no place for Arabness in Zionism. I need to repress, erase, and hide my Arab lifestyle to assimilate into European notions of Jewishness. Under such a racial caste system, you can never belong, no matter how much you assimilate. So I choose to identify as an Arab Jew because it breaks down the walls around identity that Zionism has created. 
It shatters the colonial framework and creates a possibility for a different narrative. For me, this is essential in the evolution of the discourse. Another amazing read is this article from The Nation, which focuses on work by activists like Orly Noy. She references this quote from Israel's foreign minister in 1996, which called Israel a villa in the middle of a jungle. In this interview, which I do not own, The Nation owns it. I am borrowing it because I think it is best that you hear it from her. Please don't get this taken down for copyright. Thank you. If you look at yourself as a villa in the jungle, and the jungle being, of course, the Middle East, what does it mean about the natives of the jungle? It's us, the Mizrahim, and the Palestinians, of course. Where the Palestinians fit into this picture, we know they are remaining mostly outside the walls of the villa. The Mizrahi Jews are allowed to enter the villa, but then they need to constantly prove that they, are, that they need to earn their place in this imaginary villa, that they need to be more patriotic to get rid of any trace of Arabhood in their identity, their language, their cultures. We do have a mutual uh, interest with the Palestinian population in really breaking down the walls of this imaginary white villa. Did you hear that part also about how she said, many feel that they need to be more patriotic? That holds a clue as well, I think, to the tendency to vote more conservative and have more nationalistic leanings. Another element that is really, really important to look at here is that, similarly to how Ashkenazi Jews have experienced decades and decades, centuries of pogroms, so have Jews from North Africa and the Western Asian region. Actually, it turns out that something we do not have all of the time and knowledge to unpack right now is the history of how Mizrahi Jews came to Israel in the first place. There are many that hold the opinion that it was not safe for anywhere in North Africa or Southwestern Asia for Jews before Zionism, and that many were expelled and had to come to Israel. Others argue that it was Zionism itself that led to their expulsion, or that Israel played an outsized role and had vested interest in getting this population to come to Israel so that they could create a majority Jewish population. One thing we all agree on is that once they got there, Mizrahi Jews were incredibly oppressed in often absolutely horrific ways. The reason this is really important to begin to try to dig into, as we are really just beginning to do here, is the recent phenomenon of what this writer calls Misrahi washing, the new face of Israeli propaganda. It usually looks like this. How can Israel be a white settler colonial state if most of us are not white? The truth is that, to echo Hadar Cohen, Israel absolutely has a racial caste system, which places people at the top that are able to act the most non-ethnic. I know many American families like mine can relate. We know that system of becoming white, or at least attempting to, and sometimes succeeding, which involves hiding or suppressing or being taught to literally hate who you are. The other girls were blonde and delicate, and I was a swarthy six-year-old with sideburns. I so badly wanted to be like the popular girls, all sitting together, talking, eating their Wonder Bread sandwiches. What's that? It's moussaka. Moussaka? <laughs> I may be treading into some difficult waters here. This is a new topic for me. Um, but anyway, it's something that I'm exploring. I'm trying to figure it out. There is also this, ver this version in Israel that people refer to as Ashkenaziness, where people that are not Ashkenazi want to become closer to Ashkenaziness or get closer to this kind of Israeli form of whiteness. Again, all of the cultural markers of what it really is to be Ashkenazi, the Yiddish, our full culture in general is often quite suppressed in favor of the Israeli identity, which is what we are going to talk about next. <laughs> Before that though, as a side note, because I don't think we have time to get into it today, you can see a lot of this paradigm played out through architecture, specifically in Tel Aviv. 
I've been reading White City, Black City, which tells the story of Bauhaus architecture or lack thereof in the city of Tel Aviv and sort of another myth that surrounds the creation of these very, very white buildings with very little ornament and very little decoration and color. There was actually an era during the reign of Menachem Begin, non-Ashkenazi Jews got the power, the ability to build their settlements on land that was stolen from Palestinians. And in contrast to the Bauhaus architecture, which had dominated the landscape in Tel Aviv for decades, they were allowed to build their houses in any style that they wanted. And often that architecture was seen by the left-leaning, liberal, elite, educated Israelis as being very gauche, very cultureless, very tacky. Similar in a way to how a lot of American liberals will look at Trump architecture and call him classless. Funny how that doesn't help him not get elected, actually. So, you know, here we are. I don't know if this was a good idea. I don't know if this was a good idea. I'm gonna take a break. We're gonna pause this, I'm gonna take a break. Okay. All right, I've come back. <clears throat> I have taken a break. I have come back after about five minutes. I ate five pretzels and I now have liquid peanut butter alcohol in a shot glass that says Dwink Wisconsinly. You see that? Dwink Wisconsinly. It says drink, but it feels like it says Dwink. <laughs> We're gonna talk about the weaponization of trauma. Again, be nice to me. This is my first YouTube video and it may be going very poorly, but I don't know. I think I deserve a treat. Maybe we should have a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Generational Trauma. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. It is no secret that Netanyahu has weaponized Jewish trauma for his own gain for a very, very, very long time. One famous example is when he used the excuse of something about like paying tribute to the Holocaust to get out of a international criminal court that would have tried him for war crimes, war crimes that he definitely did. And of course we are seeing this repeat itself in a very, very literal way right now with the victims of the Hamas attack from October 7th. Something I feel like I don't see talked about enough is the fact that a lot of the families of these victims feel like they have been neglected. Families of hostages have also been angry, saying they've been forgotten and not told enough information. The Prime Minister did meet with them this Sunday, and the family said that Netanyahu told them that one of the goals of the war against Hamas was the return of the hostages. You would think that with all the talk that the Israeli government and their supporters do about these hostages and all of the pain that they're going through and all of the blood that is being spilled. Oh, this is all for the hostages. Oh, we're just trying to free the hostages. This is bullshit for so many reasons. But one thing that really illustrates just how bullshit it is, is again, the fact that he appears to be ignoring a lot of the demands that the families of these hostages are making. Shalom. אנחנו נמצאים בשבי, בשבי החמאס, 23, כמה ימים? 23 ימים. אתמול הייתה מסיבת עיתונאים עם משפחות החטופים. אנחנו יודעים שהייתה אמורה להיות הפסקת אש, היית אמור לשחרר את כולנו, התחייבת לשחרר את כולנו, ובמקום זה אנחנו נושאים במחדל הפוליטי, ביטחוני, צבאי, מדיני שלך. בגלל הפשלה הזאת שעשית בשביעי לאוקטובר, בגלל שלא היה צבא שם, אף אחד לא הגיע, אף אחד לא שמר עלינו, ואנחנו אזרחים תמימים, אזרחים שמשלמים מיסים למדינת ישראל, נמצאים בשבי, בתנאים לא תנאים. אתה הורג אותנו, אתה תהרוג, אתה רוצה להרוג את כולנו, אתה רוצה עם צה"ל להרוג את כולנו, לא מספיק טבחת בכולם. לא מספיק אזרחים ישראלים נהרגו, שחרר, שחרר אותנו עכשיו, שחרר את האזרחים שלהם, שחרר את האסירים שלהם, שחרר אותנו, שחרר, שחרר את כולנו, תן לנו, 
תן לנו לחזור למשפחות שלנו עכשיו! עכשיו! not genocidal people and it is very clear that killing babies doesn't solve killing babies as one of them put it there is another more practical level here which is that fear and concern for the livelihoods of their family members that are being kept in gaza it turns out that carpet bombing the entirety of gaza where the hostages are being kept you know there's a pretty good likelihood that those hostages will die of course there is quite a lot to get into about more and more reports that are coming out about how so many of the israelis that died on october 7th may have been killed by israeli forces not by hamas themselves people have been referring to something called the hannibal protocol or Hannibal Directive, which is essentially this notion that is controversial even within Israel as well, that it is better for an Israeli to be killed than taken hostage by Palestinian groups such as Hamas. And generally, the Hannibal Directive has been used on Israeli soldiers, IDF soldiers. This, some are saying, is the first time it has been used on civilians, on people that are not currently serving in the IDF. Part of me wonders how much this relates to that mythology we talked about, the rejection and oppression of anybody that is considered a victim. It almost feels like the Israeli government under its current leadership would rather see dead Jews than Jews that could be considered in some way a victim. A lot of people have also been talking about the fact that once the hostages come back, they may be telling stories, as we've already started to see them do, of how Hamas treated them with kindness, which is wild, right? Not something that a lot of people would have expected. And already the mainstream media seems to be glossing over the stories that are already coming out about said kindness. As we'll get into in a little bit, I don't want to harp too much on this idea of Hamas as exclusively super kind people. Taking somebody as a hostage within itself is not, it's not something I support. I don't think it's been really good for the Gazan people. Not really my thing. We'll, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But what's interesting to me here is just how much the Israeli government and the powers that be that determine Israeli policy use the trauma of Jews, but do not actually study the history of that trauma. Of course, many, many, many people, even people that I really expected better from, Dana, have been drawing comparisons between October 7th and the events of the Holocaust. And I've already talked about how those events are quite different. We can talk about just how horrible and scarring those events on October 7th were without relating them to the Holocaust. Because doing so really, really amplifies the Israeli call for the eradication of people in Gaza as they draw a comparison between Gazans and Nazis which is so incredibly wrong on so many levels. Even Hamas itself, a organization I wholeheartedly do not support and do not like what they did on October 7th, there are differences between them and Nazis. Of course, we have seen for years and years and years and years that the Israeli government will call anybody that is critical of their actions an anti-Semite. And Jews are not excluded from this type of threat. No, this type of accusation. Okay, I have to take this off. Not because I don't want to wear it anymore, but because this room is weirdly hot. Okay, I'm going to put it right next to me. It is still a part of this discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Kufia. Thank you for everything that you do. Why is it so hot? It's October. It's October. This is wrong. A lot of the people that are demanding a ceasefire that are being called by 
the ADL, for example, anti-Semites or what did they say? The photo inverse of a white supremacist, which I don't think they meant what they thought that meant, you know. Keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Inconceivable! We love him, by the way. Part two, that man who has a name. The point being, a lot of those people, for example, Ben Lorber, are anti-fascist historians. We are the people that have actually studied the Holocaust probably closer and can see all of the signs of what a genocide looks like. We have studied anti-Semitism very, very closely, and we have studied how it relates to the oppressions of many, many different groups and how those oppressions are interlocked with ours. An upcoming book by Ben Lorber and Shane Burley, whose article we read from extensively earlier, is actually going to be exploring how it is solidarity and not bombs and fences and apartheid that will bring us safety as Jews. All of this is to say that Israel takes advantage of the trauma and this kind of mythology of how we imagine the Holocaust that they are counting on people to have studied for like one semester in eighth grade and not actually getting into the history of what really happened. They are counting on us having that traumatic linkage, even if you're not Jewish, with what the Holocaust was and using that as a reason or an excuse to do whatever they want. I should make it clear, if you haven't come across my page before, if you haven't uh, interacted with my work before, my entire world, everything that I do is working against white supremacy, working against fascism. I'm an anti-fascist art historian. So point being, this is not just me spouting off, saying whatever I want. I spend my life studying white supremacy, studying authoritarian regimes, and specifically how they relate to architecture, art, and various forms of visual media. So that is where I'm coming from. Um, I'm technically an anarchist, but we don't really have to get into that today, and or maybe ever, actually. I might never actually get into it, but it's kind of it's kind of just like a fun fact. Obviously, I don't believe that statehood solves anything for Jews. I do think that solidarity and fighting anti-Semitism, actual anti-Semitism, does. There's a number of things that the Israeli state gets out of the suppression of actual Jewish history, whether that is the stories of times that we flourished outside of the Holy Land, but that suppression, including the suppression of Yiddish culture, also erased the hundreds of years that Jews and Palestinians, or they were also Palestinians, so Jews and their Muslim neighbors lived side by side in Palestine. There's an entire book about this called Lives in Common, Arabs and Jews in Jerusalem, Jaffa, and Hebron. Noam Rotem wrote for Plus 972 Magazine a really good review of this book. He says, Menachem Klein describes a reality that seems almost like a dream today. He quotes memoirs of Yaakov Elazar from Jerusalem, who remembers how the Muslim women cooperated respectfully with the customs of the Jewish religion, the Muslim neighbors allowed the Jewish women to pump water necessary before the Sabbath. He also describes the Cheder, which is a traditional elementary school where the basics of Judaism and the Hebrew language were taught, run by the Hacham Gershon in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, where Arab parents brought their children so that they would learn how to behave pro pro properly. Okay, but that was actually a serious thing. These are just two anecdotes, but the very existence of Palestinian Yiddish, a dialect of Yiddish which has incorporated a lot of Arabic terms that was still being spoken by the Jews of the old Yeshuv who lived in Palestine for centuries before the political Zionists got there, or I should rather say before the British arrived, were speaking this dialect of Yiddish. This dialect shows a very, very long history of exchange between Muslims and Jews in this region, living side by side in what I'm gonna call relative peace, relative definitely to what's happening today, but also a lot of that time really was pretty
pretty peaceful. When I posted about this, I immediately got some backlash from people who said that this was not always a peaceful time. And that is true. There are a lot of eras of Jewish existence around the world that can be romanticized. And so I don't want to say it was exclusively peaceful, but I did do a little bit of digging. Okay, it was never, 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 never. You might argue with me, that's okay, but here's what I found. In 1009, there was the destruction of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem by the Fatimids. In 1073, there was some persecution against Jews and Christians by Turks in Jerusalem. Then we're gonna skip ahead 200 years. 1266, the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron is converted into a mosque and closed to Jews and Christians. Okay, not ideal. We're almost at the we're almost at the part that is going to make the point I want to make. It's in 1517 that we see the first pogrom of Hebron during Ottoman Palestine. I don't want to sugarcoat over that at all because I don't think that seemed like a really good time. But it's interesting to me that it is not until 1660 that we see two pogroms in Safed in Ottoman Palestine. And then not again until 1834. That is the second pogrom in Hebron in Ottoman Palestine. But in that entire 500 year period, that is actually comparing to how a lot of Jews have experienced things around the world. It's a relatively small number of pogroms. Things get much worse after 1914. What I wanted to illustrate before there, even though there is absolutely eruption of violence, there are also centuries uh, where not that much, I think, happened. There is a lot of overlooked history of what actually happened there, what life was actually really like before political Zionism, that political Zionism which starts in the 1800s. Now, let's be clear. So much of what has happened in the last hundred years really can be blamed on the British a lot. It is during the British Mandate of Palestine that the threat against Jewish existence in the country of Palestine escalates a lot. In 1920, we see massacres. 1920 to 30, various riots. And it seems like a lot of that was instigated by the presence of the British. Take a look at the Balfour Declaration. Take a look at just how much the British were completely instrumental in the creation of an oppressive Israeli state. Eventually, we saw a lot of powerful figures in the political Zionist movement collaborate closely with the British because, you know, they saw the British forces as helping them get to what they wanted, this nation state of Israel. And that often also included collaborating with British anti-Semites. The British may have backed the Zionists and given them aid and information, but many were nonetheless anti-Semites who frequently referred to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Many, many, many people did not actually care about the well-being of Jews. They just, the British I'm talking about, the Goyim that were helping out in all of this, just wanted to see the Jews of their country leave. Le Corbusier. He was somebody that later would talk about ways to get all of the Jews out of Europe and into Israel. And then I think he would also later like build buildings over there. Um, as would Philip Johnson, noted anti-Semite, basically a Nazi, would also <laughs> contribute to architecture in Israel. The collaboration between Israeli authorities, the most powerful people in Israel, and anti-Semites is long and storied which goes up until at least the last couple of years with Netanyahu collaborating closely with Nazi militia in Ukraine, I'm pretty sure. There's a whole other story of something called the Transfer Agreement, which was the collaboration between Zionist organizations and Nazi Germany, where they had an agreement to transfer large numbers of Jews from Germany to Palestine. The Transfer Agreement from 1933 to 1939, so that 
is strangely a lot of uh, the time of the Holocaust, enabled the extraction of Jewish wealth from Nazi Germany to Palestine through the import of German goods. This whole thing is really weird and requires a lot more study. It should be an incentive for German Jews to emigrate by enabling them to transfer part of their property to Palestine. They paid in the property at one of the transfer banks in Germany and that local importers used this money to buy goods in Germany, like building materials, and then that was sold to Palestine. When the emigrants arrived in Palestine, they got their money back after a deduction of that cost. More than 50,000 Jews emigrated under what was also called the Havara Agreement. An estimated 150 million Reichsmarks were assumed to have been transferred. The reason this is also important is that it is a part of the building boom in Tel Aviv. This transfer of German goods, which I don't think I'm smart enough to understand the intricacies of how this worked yet. I guess I've learned to be uh, increasingly uh, less apologetic about being an intellectual. And I actually think of myself as not too bright, but I'm pleasantly surprised to always discover it's enough. A real building boom began based on this mass of construction material, coining the white city Tel Aviv from cement to tiles. So incredibly odd. The Zionist movement was the only authorized Jewish organization in Nazi Germany and was thereby able to transfer around 53,000 Jews to Palestine, saving them from persecution. So by the way, to be clear, we're happy that those Jews uh, did not die in the Holocaust. I want to be very clear about that. The problem is that this eventually benefited the Nazis? It is really emblematic of this long, long, long history of Zionists and powerful leaders in Israel collaborating very, very closely with anti-Semites to frighten and scare Jews out of our homes in the diaspora so that we can grow the population in Israel and strengthen the nation state. I'm sure a lot of people who were a part of the transfer agreement, were a part of collaborating with British anti-Semites and all of these people in order to set up the nation state of Israel probably said to themselves, hey, you know, I know that those people are bad and that they hate us, but this is what we have to do for our safety, for our security. What else can we do? What other option do we have? Mm. And so this really gets back to actually this notion of the golem, that we have to create some incredible, terrifying weapon in order to protect the Jewish community. Now we're in the 1970s, and I've already talked about this extensively, but this is the era where the Israeli government is directly supporting the growth of what eventually would become Hamas, originally termed Mujama. They were warned again and again and again by other Muslim leaders from around Gaza that Hamas, or what would eventually become Hamas, was very, very dangerous and was not going to help anybody. But Israel um, says that they saw them as a charitable organization, but again, they were definitely clearly violent during the time that Israel claims that they weren't violent. They stood by and allowed them to violently clash with the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, that Israel saw as its main threat. Importantly, the PLO was much more leftist. Um, they also engage in direct action and violence. I'm not gonna get into all of that today, but they were secular versus Hamas, which is much more focused on Muslim national identity. The point being that Israel continued, at least until 2019, to allow for funds to be transferred directly to Hamas, not because they saw it as benefiting the people of Gaza, but because they saw it as a direct threat to Palestinian solidarity, to Palestinian people coming together under the larger Palestinian authority and representing an actual threat to Israeli statehood. As former General Avner Cohen said many times, he was warned that this was going to be a problem. 
um, and they kept doing it anyway. But also, he's actually referred to Hamas as a golem itself. Now, my politics probably could not be more different than Avner Cohen. I wanted to preface that. And I think it's pretty dehumanizing to refer to a group of human beings as a golem. But I do find it interesting that there is that warning where they see that... But I... Yo. Beep beep. Beep beep is right. Going back for a second to this notion of the Jewish strongman and the early Jewish mafia in the US, Arnie Bernstein, who is the author of Swastika Nation, which traced the times where that mafia was fighting Nazis, traces these early Jewish criminals to the story of the Golem, a violent, amoral monster constructed by Jews to defend against murderous anti-Semitic onslaughts. This particular Golem story, and a lot of these golem stories that we've been talking about today encapsulates the fear at the heart of Ashkenazi history, that your neighbors could turn on you at any moment, and we might need to become monsters ourselves. The 1981 pulp novel The Tribe mobilizes this myth as well, telling the story of a tight group of Orthodox men who deploy a golem to survive Belzec and his unapologetic use of revenge against encroaching violence inspires them to wield the golem against any gentile deemed a threat, even communities of color now inhabiting previous Jewish neighborhoods in 1970s New York. Seems poignant, seems poignant. In this way, we can kind of see the story of two types of golems, one of them being the spawning of a militaristic Palestinian liberation force, another being the formation of the IDF itself. I have long said that Israel is anti-Semitic for a lot of reasons, one of them being that it does not actually care that Jews are put under threat by people that are so incredibly angry about the things that Israel is doing because Israel conflates the wants and needs of all Jews with its own existence. It is anti-Semitic within itself. This idea that we, Jews, in the diaspora all over the world, want this. Because, as, as you can see, a lot of us don't. And it also puts us pretty directly in harm's way. I want to preface this by saying I have long said that the threat to Jewish existence and safety today in the U.S. is much greater coming from white nationalists, white supremacists, people that probably would rather the Israeli state exist so that we could all go there. But of course, we've seen the escalation of anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic violence in these past few weeks. So, you know, again, if they actually wanted us to be safe, what they would probably do is stop um, doing war crimes and then attaching all of our names to it. That would be super great, Israel, if you could stop doing that, please. Thank you. But that's only one, one way that this golem the IDF, eventually lashes out back onto the Jewish people. The other is this monster that is apartheid itself, that is the oppression of the Palestinian people itself, which has led to the motivation to enact violence onto Israelis themselves. In a number of ways here, trauma has given rise to some of the darkest forms of violence imaginable. Becoming the thing that once oppressed you, mirroring the violence that was done to you. Remember, again, that notion of the muscular Jew from early Zionism, which saw the diaspora as a corrosive force on the Jewish body? Figures like Ze'ev Jabotinsky argued, Jews would have to follow the path all peoples have in their quest for continuity, violence. As Franz Fanon introduced in The Wretched of the Earth in 1961, the violence experienced in a decolonial resistance is the reproduction of violence introduced by the colonizer to respond with escalated cruelty, such as carpet bombing Gazan cities as a form of collective punishment does little to bring an end to suffering. It can only escalate it. Revenge is a different path than peace. The trauma of things that happened on October 7th has been weaponized in the worst imaginable ways. 
And I think we can recognize that while still not downplaying what did happen or what we know happened. Because when people do downplay it, I think it plays into the hands of the Israeli government itself. This is why I've been cautioning really heavily against people saying that the attacks that Hamas did on October 7th were a necessary part of Palestinian liberation. I said at the very, very beginning when this all began to happen that not only is it not a celebration because there were innocent people whose lives were taken, whether by Hamas or the IDF, but also because of what I thought it could lead to. Another Nakba, the things that we're seeing happen now. Of course, there's still a lot of mystery over everything that happened that day, but it hurt very deeply and very intensely to see people celebrating what happened immediately. This hurts your solidarity with Jews as well as with many, many people in Palestine that are not a part of Hamas and were not a part of that attack. Moreover, many of the deaths that you might have been celebrating were caused possibly by the IDF itself. So, you know, you can chew on that for a second. There are a lot of elements of this October 7th attack that are worth a lot more discussion, such as, of course, the fact that it was provoked by not only 75 years of oppression, but also very specific events that occurred at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the preceding month. There are also elements of influence from the government in Iran, which is full stop an incredibly oppressive regime, but perhaps much more importantly, as discussed at length, that the Israeli government knew it was going to happen, let it happen, took forever to respond, and again, probably bombed a lot of its own citizens and then used it as an excuse, or using it as an excuse, to carry out the calls to flatten Gaza, to murder and expel two million people from that region. Perhaps for oil also, by the way, but definitely because they see Palestinians as a threat to their dominion and their power. There's also a lot to talk about when it comes to Netanyahu's particular, despotic, insane mind. That man has been in power for 20 years. I don't know what else to call him other than a dictator because that's what dictators do. That's too long to rule a country. Now, don't get me wrong. I really, really, really do not want to discount everything that Hamas stands for, particularly the liberation of the Palestinian people. I just also think that we cannot and should not say that Hamas perfectly represents everything that people in Gaza want, especially when there hasn't been an election in like 16 years and half of the people that live in Gaza are children. But also, again, because I think that does play into the Israeli government's hands. They want us to associate Hamas with the entirety of the Gazan people, and they want to use that as an excuse to wipe Gaza out. When you have protests, chants, things like that, that make it look like you're supporting everything that Hamas did that day, remember that you are supporting something that the Israeli government supports also, however much they deny it right now. But there's another aspect here, which is that Hamas carried out these acts of violence against a lot of people. How many people? I don't know. What were all the specifics? We don't know. What I think that many of us can agree on was that deep, deep, deep seated anger, that deep resentment, that deep seated trauma of the last 75 years of oppression, of 16 years of living in an open air prison, Take this information, Qahir. There is no English equivalent to the Arabic word Qahir. The dictionary says anger, but it is not.
It is when you take anger, place it on a low fire, add injustice, oppression, racism, dehumanization to it, and leave it cooked slowly for a century. And then you try to say it, but no one hears you. So it sits in your heart, and it settles in your cells, and becomes your genetic imprint, and then moves through generations, and one day, you find yourself unable to breathe. It washes over you, and demands to break out of you. You weep, and the cycle repeats. This is how you feel, Qahir, when you see like more than 10,000 person between murdered and missing under the rebels. When you see more than 18,000 injured person. When your city is under carpet bombing and you cannot do anything. shift for a second to a different kind of resistance which is not to say that armed resistance is always bad and in fact I think there are many times where it is critical to survival but again we're just we're gonna shift for a second to a different kind of resistance which is the resistance through fabric through songs through dance and through storytelling we've touched on a lot of different myths today that give rise to things that are really, really dark. Storytelling can be used for evil. It can also be used for incredible amounts of good. The best golem stories, as mentioned in the beginning, are what led to the birth of Superman. And I am wearing right now another form of resistance, the kafia. Wearing this piece of fabric has given me a lot of comfort and a lot of strength that I never knew was possible coming from a piece of cloth. Here's a video describing a little bit of the symbolism in the kufiya itself. Do you know what the kufiya means? Is it just a traditional scarf? It's more than that. It is a symbol of resistance. Fighters use it to hide their identities from the British forces during the 1936 Arab Revolt. The kufiya consists of three main patterns in its design. Fishnet. The larger part of the kufi is the pattern that represents the fishnet and the relationship between the Palestinian fishermen and the sea. To many Palestinians, the sea also means freedom, especially to those who are living in the West Bank. The olive leaves, which resembles the strength and resilience of the Palestinians that persevered after 75 years under military occupation, bold, represents the trade routes going through Palestine, which played a vital role in carving the history and the rich and diverse culture of Palestinian communities. People around the world wear the kofi to stand in solidarity with Palestine and its people. So today, wearing the kofi is more important than ever to show our solidarity. This is the ornament that works as a shield. You might look at it as a physical armor protection against evil in the world in general. You also might look at it as an intellectual tool of survival. At least that is how Maud Southwell Wallman puts it in her books, Signs and Symbols, African Images in African American Quilts. These are quilts, pieces of artwork that come out of the most intense oppression imaginable, times of slavery in the American South and the Jim Crow era. They come out of traditions that can be traced directly to West African textile techniques. An analysis of African American folk art suggests a cultural strategy of sorting African heritages into intellectual tools with which to comprehend a new world. Protective religious ideas encoded into folk art were intellectual tools of survival. 
We see something similar, I think, in Godzilla. This comes from the Rotten Tomatoes guide of the Godzilla movies, and I think they summed it up well. Born out of nuclear brimstone, the Godzilla series since 1955 has served as a manifestation of ecological fears and unchecked human aggression, a satire on politics and government bureaucracy, a vehicle for giant monsters yelling each other to death. The point being that Godzilla, in its best forms, is this cathartic storytelling mechanism that helps people think through their trauma, think through the nuclear disasters, the nuclear bombs that US dropped on Japan. By the way, this was psychologically extremely necessary for many people there. There are stories of people leaving the theaters in tears after experiencing a cathartic release because during the American occupation, there was censorship on discussions of the atomic bombs, making it a taboo subject in Japan for years afterwards. Hello, it's me again. Candle for spooky effects. Because there are more monsters that we use to illustrate our greatest fears about the changing world. I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't mention that the tale of Frankenstein's monster is certainly inspired by the golem. Some scholars say Mary Shelley may very well have been familiar with golem tales since they were popularized outside of the Jewish community by 19th century German authors. And perhaps even more so, the movie Frankenstein makes heavy, heavy references to the 1920 German noir film Der Golem. What I find most interesting about this is that the theme of hubris endures. Mary Shelley later wrote, Frightful must it be, would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. Oh, in the name of God, oh, I know what it feels like to be God. It should be noted that when Shelley wrote Frankenstein, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing as were anxieties about said industrial revolution, as cities filled with machinery and smog. And as Shelley's comment shows, this book is filled with religious language. As Ed Simon writes, we read it more as a midrash on creation than we do as a manifesto about science. This drosh on creation can lead us to ask a lot of things. For one, what does it mean to create something? to create art or to create war? And two, what does it mean to create life? What makes a human being a human being? What separates us from monsters? Is it possible to lose that part of ourselves that makes us us? And once we've lost it, can we ever get it back? Of course, if you wanna know more about Der Golem and all things Golem in general, I of course highly recommend that you check out Jacob Geller's video that inspired much of uh, everything that we're doing here. <laughs>
We see it in the ways that Israeli soldiers were doing Davka before they entered into the ground invasion in Gaza that is happening now. We see it in the ways that Israel has bulldozed over so many historic Palestinian sites, renamed all of these Palestinian areas with Israeli names, has taken all of this Palestinian food and called it Israeli food, has taken all of the tatris and called it Israeli design, literally taking the tatris from people's homes who fled or who were murdered by the IDF forces and calling it Israeli. It's an integral part of the construction of Israeliness to claim that land as Israel and not Palestine. But in addition to that, the reason it is so violent is because it is stealing a critical form of resistance itself. A, a type of resistance that is something ancient, something that really every culture in the world has, which is, and maybe it's a little corny, but it is the power of art. It is the thing that we rely on to keep ourselves together as peoples, as nations, as neighborhoods, as folk cultures. The patterns, the stories, the dances, the songs, the prayers, the things that make us who we are. When we ignore them, when we forget them, when they're stolen from us, when we suppress them to replace them with some other thing, that is not ours. We forget who we are. And when we forget who we are, we become the monster. This is when the Godzilla, the golem in the stories that we tell, comes to life, turns around, fights back, and leads to our very own destruction. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope it's helpful in some way. I don't know how, um, but I had to get this off my chest. I don't know. Um, I hope you're being good to yourself. I hope you're being good to the people around you. Treat each other with kindness. Treat each other with compassion. Keep calling your representatives. Keep showing up. Keep fighting for a ceasefire. Keep fighting for peace. Keep fighting for the end of the occupation. The thing that these stories do for us is that they give us hope. And once we lose hope, it's all lost. So, um, if you're already fighting, keep doing what you're doing. If you're not, it's never too late to join. Palestine will be free. بيديهم لواحة غرد يا ماهر غرد او دلعونا دلع دلع دلعونا سمعونا صوت الخشب سمعونا